The beginning of ANP2 is practically a continuation of ANP1. Do you remember where we, where we finished ANP1? The nervous system. I think if you were to go out to the average person on the street and say what controls the body, what controls the human body, you would probably get 9 out of 10 answers or 10 out of 10 that would say the brain, the nervous system. And that's not untrue. However, when we look at how the nervous system works and controls your body functions, absolutely we know about nerves, neurons, and neurotransmitters. But with neurotransmitters, they are going to a specific muscle. They're going to a specific gland, so it's very localized. And for the nervous system, it's pretty, pretty short term, but it's really, really fast, especially when we talk about our sympathetic responses. Remember those, our fight or flight? We're gonna, those are going to be coming back around as we talk about some of these hormones as well. Well, the endocrine system is another controller of the body. It controls a huge amount of functions for the body. Metabolism, reproduction, just there, there's a huge list. So practically half the body is controlled by the nervous system and the other half by the endocrine system. And so the endocrine system controls by also producing molecules called hormones. Instead of neurotransmitters, we're talking about hormones. Instead of localized, it's widespread throughout the body. Now this is going to be a little component of our discussion here. If you've got a hormone coursing through the entire body, what prevents that hormone from causing every cell in the body to respond? The cells have to have the right receptor. If you don't hear the message, you can't respond to the message. So we've got the hormones, but we're also going to be talking about specific receptors that are expressed on cells that recognize and respond to the hormones. That's what gives the specificity of the response for hormones that go all over the body. This, however, is by and large fairly slow reaction time. There's one hormone, however, that is a really rapid reaction time and that's adrenaline. That's your sympathetic nervous system. All the rest, however, is going to be relatively slow. And hormones, depending on the hormone and depending on the type of molecule the hormone is, it's relatively long lasting. And again, there are exceptions to each one of these individual rules. But compared to the nervous system, this is what we're seeing with the endocrine system. So functions, we already said, metabolism, development, growth, blood composition. What are some things we're going to talk about and find in the blood in chapter 18? You have iron in the blood? Plasma. What else you got in the blood? Hmm? Plasma. You got plasma, which is the fluid portion that contains proteins. White blood cells. White blood cells. Red blood cells. Red blood cells. Water is part of the plasma, the serum. There's one more little component. It's a little fragment of a cell. DNA. Hmm? DNA. D well, DNA is in the white blood cells. Oh. Sorry? Uh, lymphocytes, oh, that's a name for white blood cells, but they're there. Platelets. Platelets. So we're going to talk about these different components of the blood. And hormones control the composition. How many red blood cells? How many white blood cells? Hormones are also going to help to control the fluid volume, how much water is present. The more blood volume you have, the higher your blood pressure. The lower blood volume, the lower the blood pressure. We're talking about dehydration, that's a big problem for most of us. That's controlled by hormones. Digestion. Hormones. We're going to see that, and this is probably not going to hit us until we get to the, the digestive system chapter, but there are cells in your stomach that produce hormones that help control what the pancreas does and help control what the intestines do and vice versa. There's some cells in your intestines that help control what the stomach's doing. Again, those are gonna be hormones. Reproduction. Here we're mostly talking about our estrogens, our progesterones, our testosterone, our steroid hormones. We'll talk about those as a class of hormones as we move forward. 
But again, a reminder, you cannot have a hormone unless you have a receptor to interpret the hormone. If you have no receptors expressed on any cell in your body, the hormone is just floating around doing nothing. So it's a, it's a match set. The hormone and the receptor that hears the signal and interprets the signal and makes something happen. Change in cell behavior, uh, change in metabolic function. It's part of like insulin resistance, right? So when you get insulin resistance, this is where the hormones aren't responding to the insulin that's present or you don't have enough of the insulin receptor to have an effect. And we're going to see when we talk about these things, you can increase the amount of hormone, you can decrease it, you can increase the number of receptors, you can decrease in normal physiological states. Uh, certainly in some pathologies, some uh, clinical conditions, that's not possible. Here's the other thing, endocrine system, endocrine hormones flow in the bloodstream. That's another characteristic of the endocrine system. You do have secretions like from your salivary glands, from your pancreas. These secretions flow in a system of ducts, your sweat glands. What type of Secretions would we call that? Not endocrine, but what? You remember that term? Exocrine. Exocrine secretions are through a duct. Endocrine secretions are put into the bloodstream that transports it throughout the body. And therefore, it's a specific expression of a receptor on cells that causes that hormone to be interpreted by the right cell in the right place at the right time, not just the hormone by itself. So if hormones are important, how do we control when hormones are secreted? Well, you might not be surprised to know that sometimes hormones lead to the release of other hormones. It's kind of like a circular argument, right? Which comes first, the hormone or the hormone? Hormones can control the release of other hormones. I, I think you're going to begin to realize the complexity of the endocrine system like you realized the complexity of the nervous system last semester. But if they're controlling everything in the body, you bet it's going to be complex. Another controlling factor is called humoral control, and this is about the blood. Have you ever heard this term humor before? Not funny, but humor as it relates to anatomy and physiology. Yes. Humor is a, oh, I think it might have been a Greek word, that refers to your body fluid. And when we get to the immune system, we're going to talk about cell-mediated immunity, and these are going to be your T cells in the blood. But we're also going to talk about the cells that produce antibodies, and that is referred to as humoral immunity, because those antibodies are proteins that are going to be in that fluid, in the, in the plasma of the blood. So get used to hearing that word humoral as it refers to as the, the fluids in the blood. Yeah. So if hormones control the release of other hormones, then what is releasing the hormones that are controlling the other hormones? Other hormones. Potentially other hormones, or let me let me get to it. Okay, okay, you're you're kind of ahead of me a little bit as usual. So let me get to it. So in this case, there could be materials in the blood that can lead to the release of a hormone, and we talked about two of these, and we'll talk about them more. We talked about two of these hormones at the beginning of ANP one as it relates to the control of blood sugar. Because when your blood sugar is detected in the blood that it's too high, what, does that, what hormone does that lead to be released? Insulin. And that causes your cells to take up the glucose out of the blood and lower your blood sugar. So the blood was in, the, the glucose was in the blood. It was a humoral component. And that was 
recepted, that was detected, and it led to the release of insulin from your pancreatic cells, and that decreased the blood sugar level. Your blood sugar is too low, what gets released? Glucagon. Glucagon is one of those words that sounds like glucose. Glucagon, and that causes cells to release glucose. It breaks down that glycogen store, releases the glucose into the blood, and it raises it. Remember those negative feedback loops that we talked about. That's what we're talking about here with this humoral portion of detection that leads to the release of a hormone. Yes. Now, what leads to the release of the hormone that leads to the release of a hormone? The nervous system. And what we're principally talking about here, and we're going to see this in the first portion when we get to it, is the endocrine, I'm sorry, not the endocrine gland, the pituitary gland, and its association with the hypothalamus, part of the diencephalon of the brain. So the brain is going to control the release of these hormones that are then going to go, go and control other hormones. All right, let's, let's, let's look at a picture of that. So here we have the pituitary, right? The pituitary is going to be signaled to release thyroid stimulating hormone. What is that hormone going to stimulate the release of? Thyroid hormone. All right. Here we talked about uh, uh, glucose present in the blood. There's insulin. So that's our humoral aspect. Here with a sympathetic nervous system, we have neurons innervating the medulla of the adrenal gland. When you're about to pull out of that intersection and someone runs the red light, that neuron's going to stimulate the release of what hormone? Epinephrine, adrenaline. So these are the three major ways in which hormones and their release are controlled by other hormones, by detecting components of the blood that need to be adjusted, or directly by the nervous system. Now, we have these two, two categories. I put an asterisk by this one. I don't really like that. Um, it's covered in the book, so we're going to mention it here, but we're going to kind of quickly move on of it because really hormones are not local. Hormones circulate throughout the body. And so what we're going to talk about with these are the steroids, the biogenic amines, and proteins. And then we're going to mention and just sort of give a nod over here to this group called the eicosanoids. A lot of that has to do with the immune system and uh, the cells that line your, your blood vessels. But we're, we're going to mention those as we go. So steroids are made from this horrible, icky, sticky molecule that, that we don't like, that we don't want, called cholesterol. Isn't cholesterol a horrible molecule? No, I'm being really, really facetious. No. Cholesterol is critical in keeping your membranes of all your cells somewhat fluid. And cholesterol is absolutely critical for building your steroid hormones. Now, when you look, whoops, when you look at the structure, come on back. When you look at the structure of cholesterol and a steroid hormone, I think you can appreciate there's a lot of carbons in this molecule. There's not a lot of charges if any, that I see on that molecule. So is that molecule going to be hydrophilic or is that going to be hydrophobic? Again, I'm trying to bring back some terminology from last semester that we're still going to be using. It's a hydrophobic molecule. So we can say it's hydrophobic or another way that the authors of the book said it's lipid soluble. Lipids, again, are hydrophobic. Carbon's part of the membrane. So this is a hydrophobic molecule. And a lot of the time, the way that these um, hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, that's your stress hormone, aldosterone has to deal with water, the way they're going to be transported in the blood, that's my, mainly water, is they're going to be associated with a carrier protein. That larger carrier protein that is hydrophilic, is going to basically be like an uber for these cholesterol-based molecules. So they can be transported in the blood. 
But we know if our cholesterol levels get too high, they start sticking to your blood vessels. And what starts happening to the diameter of your blood vessel? It starts getting occluded and it gets smaller and smaller, atherosclerosis. So, did you have a question? Yes, yeah, so does that like hydrophobic and like nonpolar kind of nature allow it to cross the cell wall easier? Yes, and it really has a unique way of signaling versus our traditional cell membrane receptor. And so we're gonna look at that in just a couple of slides. When you say lipid soluble, does it mean that it dissolves in other lipids? Or... I, I think it's another way to say hydrophobic. But a hydrophobic molecule will melt into our phospholipid layers. Okay. And that's what we're going to see that happen. Okay. Yes, sir? Which part of it makes it, uh, hydrophobic? So hydrophobic really has to do with all the carbons and not being charged or polar. Because remember, water is a polar molecule, and it's going to have the positive and the negative. You're going to have some hydrogen bonding between those. And if there's no charge, no way to associate with water, then it's gonna repel water. Really? Oil and water. So hydrocarbons, oil, and water don't mix. That's the way I remember it and keep that clear. Biogenic amines. When you hear the word amine, does, is there anything that comes to your mind that sounds familiar? Yes. Amino acids. So in this case, these hormones are synthesized from a single amino acid and principally it's gonna be tyrosine that is the foundation for all of these hormones. Now most of these are gonna be hydrophilic. The exception is thyroid hormone, TH. It's gonna be hydrophobic. And when we talk about these tyrosine-based hormones, we're gonna talk about epinephrine, thyroid hormone, I mean that's still gonna be a biogenic amine even though it's hydrophobic, and melatonin, some of you may be familiar with that if you have trouble sleeping, all right? Notice I skipped one. Which one did I not say? Norepinephrine. What does the word norepinephrine literally translated mean? not epinephrine. This is one of my pet peeves of all time and that's why I put the little X right there. Technically speaking, norepinephrine is much more widely secreted from neurons and it is a neurotransmitter. I think where they get this norepinephrine and epinephrine together as hormones, when your chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla secrete adrenaline, about 85% of that secretion is epinephrine. 15% of what is released is norepinephrine because when you look at the biogenic pathway of how you produce epinephrine from tyrosine, you go through a couple of intermediates. One thing you make first is dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's associated with Parkinson's. But then you also make norepinephrine and epinephrine. So, officially, when you have a sympathetic release from the adrenal gland, some norepinephrine is placed into the bloodstream. If it's placed into the blood, that makes it a hormone. But it's a minor component. And it gets really confusing. I don't like being confusing. I don't at all. So, for me, norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter. Period. Epinephrine is the hormone. I just like yes and no, black and white, all right? So for me, norepinephrine neurotransmitter, epinephrine, AKA adrenaline, that's your hormone. That's what we're gonna play with this semester. And if you're in a clinic and a doctor calls norepinephrine a hormone, let it go. Don't argue with him or her or whoever it might, just let it go. But you know you're right and they're wrong. Now, amino acids are components of proteins, right? So we also have hormones that are polymers of amino acids, polypeptides, proteins, and these by and large are gonna be water soluble. They can be small, large glycoproteins. I don't know if we really touched on glycoproteins last semester. 
what does glyco sound like? like glucose. glucose. So glycoproteins are proteins that have sugars attached, which makes them even more water soluble. And a lot of times it's the sugar that has the activity. The proteins are just a scaffold on which to hold the sugar. Do you know one important thing we're going to talk about with sugars? Your blood type. When we get to the blood section, go ahead. And, are you going to do your blood types in lab? Do y'all do that in lab? Type yourself? You know you got type A, type B, A, B, and O. The difference between those blood types is basically a sugar. Because every red blood cell, no matter what type, has a protein. It's called the H antigen. If you have this H antigen and it does not have an additional sugar attached, you're O type. If you have an additional sugar attached, I think it's a glucosamine, then you're A type. However, if you have this protein and you have a, a, a galactosamine sugar, you're B type. And if you have red blood cells that have some of the proteins with the B type and some of the A type, you're AB. So the only difference in your blood types is a sugar. So you see how important the sugars can be? Uh, sometimes even more so than the protein. Does sugar control if you're positive or negative? Uh, I don't think. The question was, does the sugar control if you're positive or negative? That's RH factor. It's a different protein. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's so bound by the carbohydrate. I think it's just the protein. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive. I'll have to check. I'm guessing. I do know the ABO groups are all sugar. So is, it, is this a product of the pancreas since it's coming, is the insulin's coming from us? Okay. Yes. So here we got insulin and glucagon, so pancreas. Anti-diuretic hormone, vasopressin. This is going to come, I believe this is a pituitary hormone. We're also going to have growth hormone and then erythropoietin. Erythro. What's that word sound like? Hmm? Red blood cells, erythrocytes. When we get to the blood chapter, this is going to be the hormone that leads to producing more red blood cells. And if you're anemic, you're going to have more erythropoietin being made. If you're working out in higher altitudes, like the Denver Broncos, my high stadium, if the oxygen's low, your body's going to produce more erythropoietin, have more red blood cells because you need more cells trying to transport the little bit of oxygen that's available. So that erythropoietin is, is for producing red blood cells? Producing red blood cells. And we'll get to that more in the, in the blood chapter. Okay. Have you seen people working out in the gym with the masks? Mm -hmm. Okay. Number one, for you people that didn't have me last semester, if you ever see me running mm -hmm. anywhere, call 911. <laughs> okay? I'm just straight up. I work out practically every day, but I do weights. I do not run. If I sweat when I'm doing weights, I slow down. I don't, mm -mm. I'm not going to do cardio. <laughs> but have you seen the people on the treadmills with the masks? What are they trying to do Produce. besides kill themselves? For They're trying to increase the amount of CO2 they have in the blood, which mimics having less O2, so that they produce more erythropoietin, produce more red blood cells, and have a competitive advantage. Because when you take the mask off, if you've got a whole lot more red blood cells, so your hematocrit, which we'll get to that, when your hematocrit's higher in normal conditions, you have an advantage. So you're having a puffing less. Correct because you're transporting more oxygen with a certain volume of blood. But that's only after you're used to it, correct? Yeah, you have to do that for a while. It's not going to happen overnight. Okay, so yeah. it's like if I use it one time, I'm, I'm still going to be helping. Help. Yeah, you do, do it one time, no, they're just going to laugh at you. Okay. Hang on just a second. I've already skipped you once today. It's okay. Um, earlier when we were talking about storage, you said they're associated with a hydrophilic carrier in the blood. So, so when we're talking about steroids that are hydrophobic, they're not going to want to mix with the serum in the blood. So they basically hitch a ride on a protein that's bigger that is hydrophilic. So that complex can be transported and be soluble in the plasma, whereas just the steroid hormone that's hydrophobic can't. And you'll see that, you'll see that in a lot of times. One of the components of plasma is albumin, and we'll talk about that. I keep talking about what we're going to talk about next semester, <laughs> uh, but albumin is going to be one of those as well. 
not the same thing. Yeah, li lipoproteins and the one lipoproteins we hear about a lot is the high density and the low density, HDL and LDL, the good and the bad. So I remember HDL, H is for halo, it's good, like an angel. LDL, L for Lucifer, bad. The good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. So that's, that's what that is. All right, put them all together. Those are our principal hormones that we play with categories based on what they're made of. And then when we talk about this local, uh, don't, don't panic about this chart. This is not one you have to memorize. But I, I know that I knew that question was coming from some special people. These particular ones we're talking about are. Okay. Not all proteins are. Some are, hydro, some are hydrophobic, yeah. So when we talk about these local, and again, I've got the asterisk, so that's technically kind of pushing our definition of an endocrine hormone. These fatty acids, about 20 plus carbon, again, hydrophobic. These are gonna be fairly local, and a lot of these are produced platelets, white blood cells, the cells that line your blood vessels. So a, a lot of these I think of as immune system cells or um, these, these hormones that are released at injury. So that's why it's gonna happen just usually at the site of an infection or the site of an injury, and it's not something that's gonna happen over your entire body. So it really is a special group, maybe an honorary endocrine hormones, based of these uh, long chain fatty acids. I just wanted you to be aware of them. We'll touch on some when we get to the immune system. Yeah. No. No. Again, that chart is to give you an idea of which cells are making it, which immune cells, blood vessels, principally. So the only thing we need to know about local hormones is the 20 carbon fatty acid in there. I would say 20 carbon fatty acids, uh, hydrophobic, and localized to injuries or uh, infections because it really is immune system so by and large. Way. No. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. See? Oh, see? Y'all will get it on the video. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, 20 chain fatty acids, water, insoluble, so hydrophobic, localized for injury or infection. Injury, infection, they both start with that. I like doing that. Same first letters. Okay, now three times fast. No. <laughs> All right. So these are the types of hormones. We know what controls the release, but how can you regulate the effect of an endocrine response? One way is how much hormone you release. You release a lot, you're going to have a bigger longer lasting, stronger effect. And that's called upregulation. You tune down the volume, so down regulation, it's gonna be less of a response. Another way that you can do this too is get rid of the hormone. If you enzymatically destroy the hormone rapidly, it's not gonna be enough around to have an effect. Do you remember in uh, last, last semester when we talked about ways in which our acetylcholine was recycled and broken down. You had acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme on the postsynaptic cell that destroyed acetylcholine as fast as it got there. Because you wanted to stop an action potential that transferred the synapse right after it starts. You, you don't want it having a long lasting effect. So enzymes are gonna be a big component. Since this is in your blood, your kidneys are gonna get rid of it. So your kidneys can remove it from the body as waste products. <coughs> you can remove it in your digestive tract, alimentary canal, maybe sweat glands can remove these things. So getting rid of it, and even the target cell, once it's stimulated, some of these cells will take it up so it's not gonna st stimulate or bother anybody else. So these are ways you can regulate the level of the hormone <coughs> and therefore modulate the level of the effect on cells, systems, and the body. Not all hormones hang around forever. When we think of half-life, what do you think of? 
half of a life? I, I think of back to the future. Because you had to have, what, was it plutonium he had for the, for the car to get us where we needed to go? Radioactive materials have half lives. <laughs> Some decay really, really, really fast. Some decay really, really slowly. And so a half-life is the amount of time it takes to break down to half of what you started with. Well, again, that's radio, radiation, and for here it's hormones. Water-soluble hormones, uh, they're going to go away pretty quick. They have the short half-lives. Uh, that's the way God made them. Um, I think because you're water soluble, you're hydrophilic, you're exposed to a lot of enzymatic degradation and enzymes that maybe other things wouldn't uh, encounter, like steroids. So here steroids are there, but they're protected by their carrier proteins that keep them hydrophilic. So it's like they have a football helmet on and not Patrick Mahomes football helmet that breaks. I've never seen that before, ever. So, steroids, longest lasting, water soluble. Remember, these are not water soluble, but they are protected by the carriers. And basically, the shorter the half life of the hormone, that means your body has to work harder to maintain the level of the hormone. Because if you're burning through a hormone twice as fast as another hormone, but you have to keep them at the same level, what does that mean? The shorter live one, you have to make twice as fast, right? So it, it's a trade-off. How much do you need? How fast is it burning up? You got to make more. Are there any factors like in the body that could affect the half-lives of you know, patients' hormones? You know, for me, about the only thing is these carrier proteins that protect some of the hormones. That's the only one that comes to mind. Um, Certainly, there are some pathologies that, yeah, I mentioned albumin earlier. It's a carrier protein in the blood. It, it's a carrier for some of these molecules, but it's also an important solute for keeping your blood volume at the right place. If you have liver disease, you're not going to make as much albumin. So there are some pathologies and clinical conditions that can affect that. Can certain, like, other endocrine diseases, endocrine system diseases kind of... <laughs> I am not an endocrinologist because as I look at the endocrine system, it's as bad as being a neurologist. I mean, it's complicated. So I, I don't know the answer to that. I would say probably, but I don't know of a specific one. There's, there's just enough interplay between these hormones that, yeah, it's probably the case. So steroids. And even thyroid hormone, remember this is hydrophobic as well. Here is, here is their action, and we kind of touched on it earlier about the carrier protein. See, here in our illustration, we can see the carrier protein right here, this little blue, I don't know, what do you call that, macaroni? That looks like a macaroni, that looks like a kernel of corn. So the kernel of corn is our hormone. And you can see when it's bound to our macaroni, our hydrophilic macaroni, can you tell I'm getting hungry? it can flow in the blood. However, when it approaches a target organ, it is released, and notice, it just passes right through the phospholipid bilayer, our cell membrane. How can it pass right through the membrane? It's hydrophobic. Your membrane is hydrophobic. So once it gets inside, in the cytoplasm, that's where you have an intracellular receptor for these um, uh, hydrophobic hormones. Once it binds, it then is integrated into the nucleus where we have differential transcription, translation, and boom, that leads to the production of a protein that can respond to whatever that hormone is signaling that particular cell to do differently. This is very different than what we think of when we talk about receptors and hormones on the outside of the cell. This is happening inside the cell. And trust me, it's a lot more complicated than this illustration shows, but that's what we need to know for now. All right? Yeah. What is the really to bind and bind to the You know, 
I would say the binding and the unbinding is, is kind of like in chemistry, the stoichiometry, it's kind of always happening. And it's about how much carrier is around, how much hormone is around. And even if this hormone, you know, like the hormones in the bloodstream anyway, when it gets out here and gets in the cell, if that cell isn't producing that hormone receptor, nothing's going to happen. It's all about the presence of the receptor, whether it's outside for a water-soluble hormone or inside for a hydrophobic hormone. A uh, threshold. Yeah, if it has to do with a threshold and, and sort of relating it to action potential, yeah. this is where I think concentration threshold, the amount of the hormone, the amount of the receptor may influence how often the hormone comes in. If you have a lot of hormone, more is going to be coming in. If you have a lot of receptor, you're going to have a greater response regardless of how much hormone comes in. Um, that's the best I can do. No, that's fine. I just didn't know if you like on that. Uh, we did, we did action potentials last semester. I was from Medicare School. Okay. So. Yeah. So you're just glad you're here now. I mean, it wasn't by choice. <laughs> kidding. I, I'm kidding. Yeah. Oh, gosh. What did you do? I ACL? Tore five things in my knee. You tore five things in your knee. Man, she could have been AMP one model. I got it. All the ligaments and oh, you got it. Mine online. I just tore my ACL. I feel like an underachiever now. Oh. Wow. How long ago? Uh, November fifteenth. It happened. I started on October thirtieth. So you're post op. Surgery. Yeah. Okay. Got it all good. Um, I got it behind on PT. I hated PT. We'll talk later. We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> all right. Water soluble. This one we're pretty familiar with. Water soluble, that means our receptor that has a portion outside the cell passing through the plasma membrane and there's a portion that's on the inside of the cell. When our water soluble hormone binds, that leads to a change in shape. See how this went from just a, a cylinder to sort of an hourglass? They're trying to illustrate the change of the shape of the receptor, which is a protein. And that change in shape then leads to different interactions with molecules in the cytoplasm. Now, we touched on this a little bit in ANP1, second messenger signaling in G proteins. If you think back again to our um, adrenergic and cholinergic receptors for muscle, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, our adrenergic receptors were linked via G proteins that once we bound norepinephrine, the G proteins went downstream to signal something else. And one of those something else's may be a molecule like adenylate cyclase, which its job, once it's turned on from the messenger that came from the receptor, that takes ATP and turns it into a, another messenger, cyclic AMP, that is very powerful, it's almost ubiquitous in a lot of cells. Once it turns on, it goes and activates something else, and here we have a protein kinase. What does a protein kinase do? We know it's an enzyme because it's got ASC on the end. We know it's acting on a protein. What does a protein kinase do? Adds a phosphate. And often when you add a phosphate to another protein, you're going to either turn that protein on and activate it, or you may put that phosphate on and it turns off a protein. Depends on its state, depends on the protein. Have you ever played with a protein kinase in AMP1? Everybody do this. You remember myosin light chain kinase? Smooth muscle contraction. Added a phosphate to the myosin and that controlled when you were able to form a cross bridge. <laughs> you remember the cross bridge? And you needed to get that phosphate off to make the muscle relax. Kinases put it on. Do you remember the enzyme that takes the phosphate off? Myosin light chain phosphatase. All right? So it, it's a similar thing here with these hormones and signaling as we've already seen with our muscle. But when you signal, that phosphorylation, we already mentioned, activation or deactivation, inhibition. 
like we saw with our muscle. You can, with these, these hormones, you can cause a cell to increase cell division. You can cause the cells to secrete their product more rapidly. You can cause there to be changes in membrane permeability, which basically speaks to the concentration of cholesterol to phospholipids in the membrane. That's going to change its fluidity. That's going to change its permeability. How much protein do you have in the membrane is also going to affect that. What do these hormones not do? Are you getting the picture of how important hormone regulation in your body is? A lot of times we think of hormones, we think of reproductive system. It is vastly so much more than just reproductive system. Muscle contraction, relaxation. See, we already did that one. Myosin light chain kinase and myosin light chain phosphatase. So, we can regulate receptor numbers, up and down regulation of receptors. We can up and down regulation of hormones, how much or how little is produced. We can control how fast we get rid of it. But the other thing that we can do is we can tag team hormones, possibly. Because cells are not going to exist with only single receptors. Cells are going to have... I would have a hard time guessing how many different receptors are on a single cell. But this is an example if you have more versus less, upregulation, downregulation. But this is the one I want to focus on. You see we have receptors of different colors. They're trying to re represent receptors for different water-soluble hormones. And when you have different hormones binding to different receptors on the same cell, there's a couple of ways this can go. One, they can work together to enhance a response to something. This is called synergistic. You can also have hormones that work in opposite directions. That's called antagonistic. And which two hormones that we played with already today are antagonistic? Mm. Insulin and glucagon, re related to blood sugar. Insulin and glucagon, one increases blood sugar, one decreases. They're different receptors for each. So whichever hormone is dominant or, or highest concentration, whichever receptor is highest concentration, that's going to lead to the effect, the greater effect. What is antagonistic? Opposite directions. Yeah, insulin, glucagon. Now you can have this one, it's called permissive. This is basically where one hormone stimulates a cell such that it is now effectively responsive to another hormone. If you didn't have the first hormone, then the cell wouldn't respond to the second one. And that's called permissive. It's like it unlocks the code so that that cell can respond to the second hormone. I would, I, the, one that, the one that pops into my head is thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroid hormone. That may not be a great example, but that's just the one. Is that the actual name of it? Thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. And thyroid hormone is a group because you're going to have T3 and T4, triiodothyronine and thyroxine. Thyroid hormone is easier. TH. All right. Correct. Yeah. Once again, this chart is not to memorize. This is a chart that is listing, I think, almost every endocrine hormone that we could talk about. But we're not going to talk about all these hormones. In fact, when we look at uh, heart, kidneys, liver, stomach, small intestine, we're going to talk about some of that when we get to those chapters. We are only going to cover these. These are the ones that we're going to cover in detail in Chapter 17 here.